Hi, everybody. Great to see so many of you here. I'll talk about two things. First, about my, my passion to have decision makers understand how machine learning works. I strongly believe that we shouldn't make decisions about legislation, about our few digital future by people who don't understand what they are talking about. I think that's dangerous. And I also think that it's a bad example for our children. We should teach our children to be always curious, always learning, always believing in their ability to understand complicated things. Just dive into it and you'll learn. And I have talked to a lot of audiences, to the Finnish cabinet twice. I gave them two hours of machine learning training talked to the European Commission, I've talked to the UN ambassadors, I have talked to hundreds of 12-year-old girls, lots of different audiences with the objective of helping them to get an intuition of how machine learning works. And I have created a five-step approach for companies to try to map the journey to AI. And it starts with understanding. I believe that understanding belongs to everybody. So in Nokia, we have a goal that by the end of this year, every single one of our 100,000 plus employees have done a online course in machine learning. And not just done it, but also passed a small quiz at the end of it. And we asked last summer, last spring, in our employee survey, 20 questions. One of them was, do you feel that you truly understand how machine learning works? And half of our employees said yes. The other half obviously said no. The half that said yes were predominantly or increasingly they said yes as we go south in Europe. <laughs> Which led me to, to be a bit suspicious about the outcome. But the fact that half of them felt strong enough about their ability to say yes, was a, it was a great piece of news. Even more interestingly, when we looked at what these people uh, answered the other questions, it was clear that there was a huge difference in how entrepreneurial they felt Nokia is, how low hierarchy we have in their opinion, how much of a risk taker we are. So I'm not claiming causality here, but there was a huge correlation that the half who believed that Nokia will make it big and Nokia has a great culture, they felt they understood machine learning. And then there was a big gap to the other half. So I hope that by training everybody, maybe we'll move some of the people from this latter half to the first half so that there would be some kind of a causality here as well. But I do believe that by learning, people gain motivation. They believe in themselves stronger. And when we believe in ourselves, we also believe in the organization we work for. So first understand and building competence. I, you need group of experts. In Nokia's case, that's Bell Labs. We have about a thousand PhDs in Bell Labs around the world. And for example, convolutional neural networks were invented in Bell Labs by Jan LeCun. So we have a long tradition and long history of investing in machine learning. And there's some great competence there. So they can fly in to help an R&D team in India when they have gotten stuck with their machine learning project. And then after receiving help, that top expert flies back to, to Murray Hills or wherever he's based and is within his, his peer group of other world leading experts. And it's much easier to recruit world leading experts into a group where there already are world leading experts. Third, creating a data strategy, sort of two halves, the IT infrastructure, data lakes and so forth. And second, 
thinking about what kind of data do we need in five years time so that we can build the systems that will define our competitiveness at that time. We need to have an idea of that right now. So as part of strategy, we need to think about data. What kind of data do we need? Where can we get it? How do we acquire it? And then just applying it internally. We have tens or maybe hundreds of projects underway in Nokia at the moment where we are attempting to solve a business problem, increase efficiency, improve quality through machine learning. And finally, integrating to solutions. And then we have probably 100, 200, 300 projects underway around the world. And you can do all these at the same time. But by dividing it like this into six parts, although there are five boxes, you can have six people in charge of a part of this journey. And you can have a budget for each of those six, and you can track it, you have KPIs and so forth. And it helps you to manage it. You get the ball rolling. When I was talking to professional board members, a few weeks ago, I gave them a sort of a basic lesson on machine learning, how it works. At the end of it, a feedback from a number of them was that we didn't want to hear how machine learning works. We just want to know what we need to know about it. And the way I think about it is that I can't tell a board of a company what they need to know about machine learning because I don't know their business. I don't know their challenges. They need to understand the topic to figure out themselves what they need to know. They need to understand both their business and the technology to decide how to apply it or what the road forward should be. Or does our management team understand anything about this? So. That's the first topic. The second topic that I want to spend a moment on is a part of machine learning that I have been quite interested in myself lately. And that's sort of trying to understand the difference of machine learning and human programming. And I'll try to be very quick, so you'll probably miss some of this, but if we... If we would need to create an application that can differentiate between horizontal, vertical, and diagonal lines in the simplest possible uh, four square, we could easily create a neural network that does that. And it would look like, like this. And here we only have plus one, minus one, and zero weights defined by the, the colors, and we can only have those three values in any of the cells. And this is programming. If I gave you a neural network, it's a programming platform. I can give you a challenge and you can program it manually, just like this. This is what a human being would probably do if we would be given this programming environment and this challenge. If we would do this using machine learning, the outcome would not be the same. So it's fascinating for me to think about how does a machine learning system learn or neural network learn? Why does it find the optimal solution that is incomprehensible to a human being, whereas a human being who would try to use that same platform for programming would start with a completely different approach? And then what is the, the impact or meaning of this difference? So for example, here we have a neural network that <laughs> learns to recognize numbers and you can visualize, the, the, in this case, a 20 times 20 bitmap. And that's 400 weights. We can visualize the weights here. It's initialized with random numbers. And then as it learns, you can visually see how it learns, how the weights change. And you can try to see some shapes here that would mean something. I have no idea what they mean, but you could try to see some meaning there. That's one way to visualize. Then we can think about spell specialization. For example, does this cell in the neural network identifying manually written numbers, does it specialize in something? The, the way a human being would program a neural network to recognize numbers would be probably to think about sub-programs. 
some part would recognize curves, some would rec recognize horizontal lines, vertical lines, diagonal lines. So does it learn the same way? And of course it does not. So in this case, if we <coughs> look at it here where they learn weights for the first hidden cell, we ask what kind of input would fire up this cell here to the maximum amount. So what, would, what kind of an input would excite this cell? And this is the input. And there's really no, it's not a one, it's not a two, it's not a curve, it's not a diagonal line. It's just, it looks <coughs> fairly random. The same applies to the second cell. Here are the two images and the third cell. So these are what those cells specialize for. For a human, that's incomprehensible. Then, if we move forward, we have the same network. We have an input image we feed in here. And then we, we can see that that's a three. But then if we would change the image based on sort of the back propagation without using any learning rate with and without using batches, just change the input image so that it would maximize the value for being a number, for example, one. So what would that look like? So here we have a, it doesn't show the whole, whole slide, but here we have a random in, in initialization. It believes that it's 24% likely to be a five. Other likelihoods are very close to zero. So this might be a five according to the, the neural network. Then if we ask it to make it a zero, so we just move the information from, from the zero cell so that the input image is as close to a zero as the network can make it, it achieves actually 99.9% .9 likelihood that this is a zero. It doesn't exactly look like uh, what we would draw, but this is trained with only 4,000 images and it has not been sort of trained to do this. Then if we ask it to make a one, again starting with the three image that I showed you, and achieves 99.9% .9 likelihood that this is a one. And it does look a little bit like a one. But then if we would do another exercise and we start with the image of the three and then we move from that to a blank image. And now I'm showing you sort of a animation of the outcomes. So the first image is the number, uh, was it one? No, it's the number three. We, we try to improve the three. So starting with the three, but making it a better three. And then we go slowly towards a blank image and starting from that blank image, we try to make a three. And now you can see how that happens. So the final image here, this one, is the perfect three starting with the blank input values. And you can do all sorts of these visualizations and I think it's, it's fun to try to figure out the difference in the outcome between what a human brain would create and what a system that has been taught will create. I don't think it's very useful, but it's, it's good fun. And the, the fundamental challenge of trying to understand also the drawbacks of machine learning systems by using these different ways of trying to understand what each part of a neural network has specialized to do given a certain problem is a useful exercise.
but for me this has just been been fun thank you